Welcome to the second in our two-part series on the Big Mac Mystery. In this series, we are discussing the strange and interesting world of Ethernet Macs. In part one, we discussed the Ethernet Mac layer cake, where we looked at the various components of an Ethernet Mac and how they come together. For the rest of this presentation, we will be using the following summary diagram of an Ethernet Mac and its components. The first component is the Physical Medium Attachment Layer, or PMA, otherwise known as a transceiver. This device takes the high rate connection coming from the network, usually 10 gigabits, and samples it down to a wider and slower bus speed. The PMA is connected to the PCS, or Physical Coding Sublayer. This layer handles encoding of idle symbols and frames of data. One of the major functions of the PCS is to ensure a good spread of ones and zeros on the line for high-speed clock recovery. The PCS is finally connected to the MAC layer, which understands Ethernet-level semantics, including interframe gap spacing and frame check sequences. Although this diagram is mostly focused on the receive side, the corresponding transmit side is very similar. So the question that we're trying to answer in this part is, how do you measure the performance of an Ethernet MAC? And specifically in this case, we mean the latency of a soft Ethernet MAC provided in FPGA logic. The first and most obvious option is to simply count the number of cycles used by the logic. If we look at the logic components that are provided, we see that these include the PCS and the MAC. So we can take our first measurement starting at the input to the PCS and finishing at the output of the MAC. We can repeat this process for the transmit side. Throughout this presentation, I'm going to be providing concrete examples of results from our high-performance XMAC device. The results that we obtained from doing this measurement are in the RX side, one cycle, and in the TX side, also one cycle. The clock speed used is 322 megahertz, meaning that each cycle is 3.1 nanoseconds. Therefore, the total delay through the PCS MAC is 6.2 nanoseconds. There are several problems with this type of measurement. The first is that it is hard to obtain and validate without access to the original source code. The second is that this is not a real-world measurement. It does not include any physical medium layer, it does not include the SFP or PCB, or any other artifacts of reality. Before we move on to other measurement methodologies, we need to consider clock domains. There are two different clock domains present in the system. The first is the recovered clock, provided by the receive side. The second is the transmit clock, which is generated locally. To move between these two clocks, we need a clock domain crossing. It is important to keep these clock domain crossings in mind as we look at further measurement options. The next measurement option is an external packet loopback. In this measurement, we connect a cable from the transmit side to the receive side and a test harness that generates new packets. When the test harness generates a packet, it registers it with instrumentation, such as chipscope. When a packet is received, the starter frame signal is crossed into the clock domain of the instrumentation and a comparison can be made. Again, we have done this measurement on our own XMAC. We have taken 100 measurements, and from these measurements we found a delay of 50.62 nanoseconds, including cabling delay. Cabling delay can be very difficult to estimate accurately. If you're interested in this topic, I encourage you to look at my previous videos on nanosecond scale network measurement. Assuming roughly 1 meter of cable at roughly 4.9 nanoseconds per meter, our final measurement becomes an average speed of 45.72 nanoseconds. Again, there are several problems with this measurement methodology. The first is that the cabling delay is unknown and has to be estimated, and this reduces the quality of the measurement that we're taking. The second is that the transmit starter frame and receive starter frame signals need to be crossed into the same clock domain, and this needs to be accounted for in the measurement. Also, looping back a device onto itself can cause synchronization issues in highly optimized devices. These can be avoided, but this adds an extra latency penalty. Finally, this measurement suffers from a very low number of samples. An alternative measurement methodology might be to use an internal loopback rather than an external loopback. In this case, received packets would be buffered into an internal buffer, which allows them to safely cross the clock domain. An external test harness can be used to measure the performance of the system accurately. If you're interested in further details on how we achieve this measurement, I encourage you to look at my previous videos on developing a reliable methodology for nanosecond scale network measurement. The results of our measurement in this case are indicated on the following graph. On the x-axis is latency in nanoseconds, and on the y-axis is the number of samples that we took. This measurement consisted of 10 million samples. 
The median result in this case was 58.53 nanoseconds, and the minimum was 50.53 nanoseconds. Once again, there are several problems with this measurement methodology. The first is that it's an unrealistic test scenario. Full loopback inside of an FPGA device is a fairly uncommon use case, and it doesn't really reflect the use case of our clients, which is typically tick-to-trade scenarios. A measurement option more reflective of our use case is a packet trigger. In this case, when a packet arrives, the start of frame signal is crossed into the transmit clock domain and triggers the sending of a frame. The results of this are displayed on the following graph. You can see that the average here is 39.83 nanoseconds, and the minimum is 33.58 nanoseconds. This is an incredibly low latency performance, so good that you might even think that it's not real. And there is a problem with this measurement. If you're watching carefully, you may have noticed that I used the early starter frame signal for crossing into the transmit clock domain. The early starter frame signal is presented in the PCS layer. So looking at our diagram, we actually need to move our starter frame signal further backwards. The PCS layer starter frame signal triggers several cycles earlier than the MAC layer. It is arguable whether this provides useful and sufficient information or whether we are simply gaming the system. Although option 4 is an improvement on our previous options, it does not include protocol overheads and is potentially gameable. A slight modification on top of option 4 is what we call inspection with a trigger. In this case, packet data arriving on the RX side is inspected. The first four bytes of the Ethernet destination address are inspected and checked against a bitmask. Assuming that the bitmask matches, a starter frame signal is crossed into the transmit clock domain. This triggers a frame, which is then sent. This option is a more realistic representation of a trick-to-trade scenario. We have a market data parsing-like operation, causing a trigger which generates a frame. The results of this measurement are shown on this curve. The median latency in this case is 47.83 nanoseconds, and the minimum is 40.08 nanoseconds. Going forwards, as Exablaze quotes the performance of our Mac, it is this number that we are going to use. The fifth option has several benefits over previous options. First, it is measurable at home and does not require any vendor trust or access to the source code. Secondly, it is a realistic test scenario that mirrors the tick-to-trade use case that these devices are typically used in. Third, no estimation of cable lengths is required, and so the measurement bounds can be quantified very accurately. And finally, it is difficult to game because there is real data inspection on the critical path. So in summary, the XMAC is a full Mac and PCS layer, which is used in our X10, X40 and V5P products and is available on third-party Xilinx FPGAs. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it. My name is Dr. Matthew Grosvenor, and I've been speaking on behalf of the team at Exablaze.